<laughs> How's everyone doing? So the data scientist walked into a bar chart. Good? OK. So uh, why did the data scientist cross the road? I don't know. I will tell you when I've hired enough of them. <laughs> All right, so I'm Hillary, um, H. Mason on Twitter, and H. at Bitly, if you want to email me. And welcome to New York. I hope everyone's had a great week here. Uh, you've probably started to, to wonder a lot about New Yorkers in the time you've been here. Like, um, you know, why do New Yorkers always ask me where I live and how much my rent is? Um, New York is really a data-driven city. So this is from Nike Plus data. It's a visualization of the most common running routes. Uh, and we're there in that uh, lower left-hand corner right now. Uh, and it shows you the city in a really sort of interesting way, right? Um, so you might also have wondered, like, where do all of those black umbrellas come from when it starts raining, and why are they all the same? And if anyone knows the answer to that, I'd really like to know. Um, and a few other things. You know, why do New Yorkers fold their pizza? Because that's how you eat pizza, OK? So what we're seeing here is sort of an aggregate analysis of the questions people have asked about New Yorkers. And it's really just evidence of people talking to each other, uh, people taking their conversations and having those conversations online in a way where we can start to analyze them and start to learn from them. And so the dirty secret of all of this social media data is that it's just gossip. It's just what people are talking about anyway. Uh, and it's the things you want to know. So gossip is uh, timely. It's not interesting if it's old gossip. It's only interesting when it's new and it's juicy. Uh, it crosses networks. So it crosses from one person to another person very quickly, and sometimes from groups of friends to other groups of friends. Uh, and it tells us something about the world that we are really excited to know, even if we're not excited to admit it. Right? And so this is a map of lights from space. Um, it's inspired by one of the Ignite Strata talks I saw. Uh, it's a NASA image. And we can do the same image. Uh, this is from Bitly data. Uh, there's no actual geographic boundaries drawn on this map. Uh, what you're seeing are clicks in a given hour. Uh, April 31st, actually, from 8 to 9 p.m., uh, just plotted by latitude and longitude. And so what we're doing is capturing all of this data uh, for the first time in one place where we can actually analyze it. Um, and there seems to be uh, a meme that this is sort of a dystopic future where the machines will turn against us and our data will be used to you know, sell us things and take advantage of us. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, the talks you heard this morning, like Data Without Borders, I think, is evidence enough that there is a bright future uh, in this data if only we find it, and we're the people to do that. And in fact, we can use it for things like this. Um, we tagged this up at a recent Betaworks Hack Day. It's trendingkittens.com. I'd invite you to visit. Um, it is perhaps the most uh, silly manifestation of what we can use this for, but it is adorable. Um, but let's talk a bit about real time. So we've, we've heard the term big data a lot, and if I even used it in the title for the talk. Uh, the truth is that I actually spend most of my time trying to reduce the size of the data so it's something we can analyze and trying to simplify it and trying to look at it along that time axis. And there are really two kinds of special data, uh, timely data and geographic data. Uh, both are interesting, but I want to talk about the concerns of real-time data. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, if you were to take the bit.ly firehose and just look at it for a few URLs, um, and I grabbed these all from this morning, uh, there's no, I didn't select these, I didn't edit them, there's, no, uh, there's nothing there. Uh, that wasn't actually in that set of URLs. So you would see something like this. Uh, and this is the slice of links that people are clicking on on the social web. It's the things that people are excited about right now. And so we're trying to turn that uh, into some sort of useful insight uh, and to do it in, in sort of a way that uh, teaches us something that we didn't know before. So real-time analysis is a little bit different than uh, a lot of the analysis we've heard about. Um, for one thing, Hadoop doesn't work so well. Uh, and it doesn't work so well because we don't have the luxury of having all of our data in one set, where we can iterate through it and loop through it over and over again until we converge on some correct answer. Uh, in fact, we have data coming in a stream 
where we have to see each data item perhaps only one time uh, and still learn something useful from it and do those kinds of calculations. Uh, so that means a lot of the infrastructure we have uh, has to change and a lot of the data we have in the algorithms have to be adapted. And we also want to do this quickly. Um, when you're operating at scale, um, whether it's, you know, secret U.S. government database scale or even just, you know, kittens on the internet scale, uh, you might not have the luxury to spend seconds analyzing that piece of data. Uh, you need to be able to come to some confident answer for whatever question you're asking quickly. And so there are a few things we've learned from this at Bitly uh, that I'm going to tell you about. One is when you have a stream of data, uh, think about the infrastructure really carefully. Uh, we use, in fact, uh, all of this stuff is open source. Uh, we use a system called Simple HTTP. Bitly engineers are really badass. Uh, it is a queuing system where everything comes off the stream, goes into a queue, is processed by multiple workers, and then put in some form of data store. At this point, for us, it's usually Redis, but it doesn't matter what it is as long as it's fast. I know a lot of people using Cassandra as well. Um, and that infrastructure allows us to adapt our algorithms to work in some interesting ways. So I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, this is a fun example uh, because it turns out the metadata actually answered the question much better than the data did. And I'll explain what that means. And also, if you factor data out of that sentence, it's kind of fun. So we were curious. Uh, we have all of these web pages. Um, about 50% of them are being clicked inside the United States. but we really wanted to know what spoken human languages were represented in a given web page. That is, uh, if we take the text of the page, you know, is it English, is it French, is it Italian, is it Japanese? Um, and so first we took the text of the page and we looked at it and we compared it to Google's Translate API. And it turns out there are a couple of techniques for doing this. They're pretty computationally expensive um, and they don't give us really good answers. Uh, but we realized we had a second data source, and this is what I'm throwing under metadata. These are the browser strings uh, with the languages from the people clicking on that uh, one particular URL. Uh, and you can see they're Spanish, English, Portuguese, uh, English, Great Britain, uh, Spanish, again, Dutch, uh, German. And so we were able to take this and build a distribution and this is uh, an article about Google Plus that's in Spanish. And you can see that the Spanish bar is bigger than the English bar and so on. Uh, and it turns out that we can use this very quickly to compute the languages in the page without even looking at the page content. We learned something else, though, which is that it finds that a page like this, this is Foursquare, um, this is a Japanese language check-in on Foursquare. So if you actually take the words on this page, the majority of them are in English. If you throw it against uh, like Google's Translate API, it thinks it's English. But it's not really English, it's Japanese. So what we're discovering here is not what is the language in the page, but what are the languages spoken by the people who are interested in the page? And I think that's pretty cool. All right, so another example um, is that we were curious how long people paid attention to things. And this is something that you can't really, we sort of all have a human intuition for it in conversation, but it's hard to look at online. Um, so we went and took a link like this and plotted it over time. And if you can see uh, those two gray lines, that's half of the clicks the link received since that first explosion point. And we did it again for this, um, this is an article about the earthquake we experienced on the East Coast. I don't know how many people were in it. It was pretty surprising. Uh, same thing here, but a very different pattern. And finally, we looked at it uh, through refers. So links being clicked on different social networks have different dynamics. And from this, we can conclude that uh, things are actually not interesting for very long at all. Um, on Twitter, the half-life was 2.8 hours. Um, it was longer on Facebook, but only slightly. Much longer on YouTube, and I think there are two factors at play here. One is the character of the content. So the first example I showed you was something that will continue to be adorable for a very long time. Uh, the second one is no longer interesting. Once you already know there was an earthquake, you, you don't care anymore. 
And then finally, we have the dynamics of the network on which the data was shared. So the way that YouTube is designed versus Facebook and Twitter uh, changes the way that people interact with the content. It'll be really interesting to see if Facebook's changes yesterday changed the numbers here, so we'll have to do that. Right. So we've also been curious about um, how ideas relate to each other. And so as things come through that Bitly stream, we've looked at the topics and those links. Uh, this is a very preliminary analysis, just showing the relationships between scientific topics and non-scientific topics. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see that biology, health, and food are all sort of clustered together. Computer science sits nicely between mathematics and statistics. And religion and chemistry are exiled uh, down to the bottom of the plot. And we didn't include it here, but adult content as well would be way off to the side. Um, so what we have here is gossip, but we can query it. And we can query it not by uh, just like, tell me about Obama. Uh, I want to know what's up with him. Uh, but in other interesting ways as well. And this is a screenshot from a Bitly Enterprise upgrade that'll be coming out shortly. Uh, where we'll make those tools available to everybody. And this is a query I did this morning, uh, right before you all got here, uh, looking at what's interesting in data in New York City today. And the very top hit is one of our own New York startups, Hype Republic. Um, and then, of course, uh, a bunch of O'Reilly stuff and things being promoted through Strata. And just in case this one doesn't drive home the point, uh, Here's what's interesting in pizza in New York City today. And I'm happy to rerun this for anybody's hometown if you find me after the talk. Um, we're losing our real original Ray's pizza in the village. So if you have time after the conference, you should head down there. All right, so let's quickly take a look at gossip again. It's timely, it crosses networks, and it tells us about the world. And that's what we're doing with analysis of all of this social data. And that analysis will be successful as long as it's simple, it's straightforward, you can run it quickly, uh, and it reduces the friction between you and learning something from that piece of data. So we can think of this as a new kind of window on the, the data and the way we can understand it. And we'll take it from here. Thank you very much.